In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you. Dear Heavenly Father, bless us today as we study chapter 17 of John's Gospel. John chapter 17. And especially help us to see how Jesus explains that eternal life is to know Him and to know the Father. And then, as the chapter goes on, help us to see the importance of Jesus' prayer. When he prays that the church would be united, that the church would be one, just as he and the Father are one. May we always strive to live out that same unity in Christ. We ask you to bless us today through Christ our Lord, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Let us turn now to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. And John chapter 17 is important because it's the last part of Jesus' farewell discourse, which runs really all the way from John chapter 13 all the way into John chapter 17. And as I said before, I like to pray this farewell discourse with people who are sick, those who are possibly dying. It's something that I would encourage you to pray with those who are sick, because what would give us a better perspective of life, death, and the resurrection than to study Jesus' words, the very things that he said before he left this world and returned to the Father. So we go to John chapter 17, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Do you notice how he keeps saying those words during his farewell discourse? The hour has come. It started in John chapter 12, between verses 20 and 24. And he repeats that because earlier in the gospel, he said, we read that the hour had not yet come. Remember that? And now the hour has come. Father, the hour has come. Notice that the prayer is directed to the Father. This is very important. Because during Mass, when we celebrate the Holy Liturgy, when we celebrate Mass, we direct our prayer to the Father in Christ with the help of the Holy Spirit. And so verse uh, 1, Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, The Father, the hour has come. And notice what he says, Glorify thy Son, that, they, that, thy son, that the Son may glorify thee. Notice the exchange of glory. The Son will glorify the Father, and the Father will glorify the Son. This is how Jesus talks about his death. His death, it's more than just mere suffering for the sake of our salvation, but it's an act of glory in which the Father will glorify the Son, and the Son will glorify the Father by doing the Father's will. Verse 2, since thou hast given him power over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom thou has given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou has sent. These words are so profound. You have to sit down and meditate on them for just a moment. The Father has given Christ all authority over human flesh, that he may give us eternal life. And then he says, this is eternal life. Knowing the Father and knowing the Son. And really, when you, when you stop and look at that word for knowing, it, it can underline the intimate knowing that we, ha that we have of God. Knowing God intimately in the context of the covenant relationship. It's more than just knowing about God, but it's really knowing the person of God. Do you see what I'm, what I'm getting at? It's knowing the person of God in the way that we live, through our actions, our words, our deeds, everything that we do, when we forgive others, we show that we know God. When we make sacrifices uh, and, and make changes in our life and turn away from sin, we show that we know the Father. Do you see what I'm getting at, my brothers and sisters? Every act of faith that we do for our Lord is an expression of how we know God. And so, you know, we can look at our own words, our vocabulary, the way we live, and, and, and examine that and say, you know, how does this show how I know the Father and I know the Son? And so what will happen? We will begin to conform our lives more and more to become like 
Christ. You see what's going to happen? As God's sons and daughters, we conform our lives to the Son, to Christ himself, so that we become more and more like him, and that we, in, in doing so, we more and more profoundly know the Father and the Son. So do you see what Jesus is doing? He's ready to give his life, he's ready to glorify the Father, and now he's praying that we would have eternal life and that we would truly know the Father and the Son. So going on, and this is really important because a lot of people, they, they go to church, they say, you know, I, I went to catechism, I was Catholic, you know, I went to Catholic schools, I made my first communion, I made my confirmation. And you know, the question I always ask them is, do you know the Father? You did all that, yeah, that's wonderful. You went through everything, you, you got in line. You got in line and you did all these things, but do you really know the Father? Do you really know Jesus? Are you really being guided by the Holy Spirit? And those are questions you can ask people. You can say, well, you might know God in the, you might know things about God, but do you really know the Lord? Do you really know him? And it's a question to ask because a lot of people who are not practicing the faith, they never really were living the faith in that way where they intimately knew the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so it's really, that's really one of the best questions you can ask people who say, you know, they don't go to church, they, you know, they were Catholic, I was Catholic, I was born in a Catholic family. Yes, but did you really know Jesus? Did you really know the Father? Were you really being guided by the Spirit? Or was it just, could it, could it have been a superficial knowing of God? Do you see what I'm getting at? And this is something that, for people who've left the church, it may cause them to think, wow, you know, maybe I never really discovered who Christ was in the first place. And so it's, some, it's a way that you could help those who maybe are not practicing the faith, who've left the church, when they to think about coming back, but to help them to see that it's more than just coming back to Mass. It's coming back to Christ, returning to the Lord, and beginning to really know who He is for the first time in your life. And so going down to verse four, it says, I glorified thee on earth, having accomplished the work which thou gavest me to do. Isn't that beautiful? Every single thing that Jesus did was to glorify his father. Every work, every miracle, every act of kindness, every act of love, all of it was to glorify his father. And this is something that we must do as well. As we live the faith, every single act of faith is an act in which we glorify the father as well and we will glorify the father in everything that we do our words our actions and then finally when we give our lives when we die no matter how we die whether we die as martyrs or whether we die of, of some other way and so verse 5 and now father glorify thou me in thy own presence with the glory which I had with thee before the world was made. Now, this is, a, this is a very profound theological verse. Let me explain it to you in other language. In, if you go to Philippians chapter 2, Paul talks about how Christ emptied himself and he became like us. Theologians call that the kenosis, the emptying. Christ emptying himself. He's in the form of God, and he becomes just like us who are humans. And then how he suffered on the cross for our sake. Essentially, the incarnation and the passion, right? And so do you see what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying, you know, Father, now that I'm going to give my life on the cross, may I have the same glory that I had with you before I came in the world. It, it underlines, in a certain sense, how Jesus has emptied himself and become, he's taken on the limitations of our humanity willingly. He willingly has become like us to save us from our sins. Sometimes people will use some analogies so that we can understand it. They'll say, it's like a man who became like a dog in order to save the dogs, you know? Like, how could Jesus empty himself that way? Others will say, well, maybe it's like somebody who became like a cockroach to save the cockroaches. You get the idea. There's really no analogy that can explain it. And here's the reason why. God is infinite. God is infinite beyond even our understanding. And for Jesus to take on the limitations of our humanity, it's, 
absolutely profound, beyond what we can even understand. And Jesus is simply saying that now that he's going to go to the cross and die for our salvation, the Father will glorify him and he will have the same glory that he had with the Father before he took on all those limitations. Verse 6, I have manifested thy name to the men whom thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. So in the Old Testament, if you go back to the Old Testament, God made his name known among the Israelites. You know, he gave his name to Moses. Do you remember where that happened at? The burning what? The burning bush, right? Where he gave Moses his divine name. And not only that, but he manifested his name through his presence. So first, the Israelites had this portable sanctuary where they would offer sacrifices and God dwelt in their midst. What was the name of that portable sanctuary? It starts with a T, the tabernacle. And then it became a permanent sanctuary under the reign of Solomon. And what was the name of that permanent sanctuary? The temple, right? And so God made his name known among the Israelites in that he dwelt in their presence and he literally forgave their sins when they offered sacrifices. Isn't that amazing, you know, that there was a, there was a way to ask God for forgiveness of sin, various ways, and he dwelt in their midst. And now here's Jesus, he's coming into the world and he is going to fulfill all the expectations tied to the tabernacle and the temple because he becomes incarnate. He makes his ta he tabernacles amongst us, according to John 1, 14. And so he's making the Lord known. He's making the father known. So the manifestation of the name is more than just my name is Tim. Your name is John. You know, he more than just Jesus helping us know the name of the father but by dwelling in our midst he's helping us to know the father and so let's go to verse number seven and it says now they know that everything that thou has given me is from thee for i have given them the words which thou gavest me and they have received them and know in truth that i came from thee and they have believed that thou didst send me. In other words, Jesus is only revealing what the Father has sent him to reveal. And that's very important because in the church we say that divine revelation reaches its fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. If a UFO were to come down and land on the grass over here of Holy Spirit and say, we have a new revelation for you, we would say, no, you don't. Because all divine revelation reaches its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And I have to use that example because, you know, there's all these things on the Internet about, you know, UFOs and this and that. And, but we have to be able to say, look, all of divine revelation reaches its fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. Nothing can supersede that revelation that we have in Christ our Lord. Do you see what Jesus is getting at? I, you, I have given them the words that you have given me. Verse nine, our Lord says, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom thou hast given me, for they are thine. All mine is thine and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now, for us who don't use thine and mine and thou and thee, here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying that everything that he has, the Father has given him. And, and, the fa and, and there's this perfect act of giving between the Father and the Son. Isn't that beautiful? This act of total giving between the Father and the Son is an act of giving that should be present in the church. In, in the sense that we should share all that we have so freely. And it's something that when you look at Acts of the Apostles and you read the first couple chapters of the Acts of the Apostles, you see how the church held everything in common. There was this absolute act of complete sharing uh, in the church. And Paul tries to address some of this in his letters because there's some freeloaders who just want to freeload off of this, if you especially read Second Thessalonians. And so this is something really to think of, you know, like how, you know, how generous am I? 
with all the things that I have. We just had the reading last uh, Sunday, yesterday, about the rich man who built more and more and more barns. And our Lord, and then he died suddenly. And our Lord said, the same will happen to you if you are not rich in the things that are important to God. And so are we rich in those things that are important to the Lord? And do we share of those things generously? Oh, how I wish we did. There would be such, there would be such conversion if we had such generosity. Verse 11, or I'm sorry, verse, yeah, verse 11. Now here's where it gets interesting, my brothers and sisters. Pay close attention to this. And now I am no more in the world but they are in the world and I am coming to thee. Holy Father, keep them in thy name, which thou hast given me, that they may be what? One. That they may be one, even as we are one. Now, you have to stop for one moment here and say, wait a minute. There is nothing more profound than the unity between the Father and the Son. And Jesus is praying that that same unity be present in the church. Do you see what do you see what I'm getting at here? This is the unity between the father and the son who are eternal. And Jesus is praying that that same unity would be present in the church. And, you know, when you look at the church, this is something amazing about the church, the Catholic church founded by Christ. It's the same church of, that Jesus founded, the same church of the apostles, teaching the same doctrine, celebrating the same liturgy, united all around the world. That's amazing if you think about it. There's 40,000 other churches in the United States, you know, and only one Catholic church. And that's kind of mind boggling to think, wow, just one church united. And this is really, I would say to you, one of the reasons why people are always attacking the Catholic church. They're going after the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church really is the moral leader in the world when it comes to all the teachings of moral theology, which are against the secular culture that we live in. But look at this for one second. Think of this for a moment. Even though you know you, you can go to mass in China, Vietnam, you know South America, you know North Africa, and you have the same readings that we had at Mass. Okay, that's one expression of that unity. It's an expression of unity. But that unity is really expressed when we receive Jesus in the Eucharist. Think about it. When we pray together as a church, we are united in the Spirit. And when we come and we receive our Lord Jesus in the Eucharist, that unity that we have as a church that prays together in the Spirit and receives our Lord in the Eucharist, it's expressed in the most beautiful way. And it's one of the reasons why people come up and say, Father, you know, why can't I receive communion if I'm, you know, uh, living in mortal sin? And I'll say very simple because because you're, you're not united to the church right now. And the church as a mother and teacher wants you to repent of that sin, turn away from that sin and become reunited to Christ. And then the Eucharist that we receive is the very expression of the unity that the church has in Jesus. Do you understand that? How important that is? Besides that, it would be a sacrilege if you had, a, uh, if you were living in, you know, mortal sin, unrepented, and came and received the Eucharist, it would also be a sacrilege. But that's, uh, that's another conversation. But look at what you, the, look at what Jesus is asking for, the oneness of the church. Verse 12, and while I was with them, I kept them in thy name, which thou hast given me. I have guarded them, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Very interestingly, Jewish uh, Judas is called the son of perdition. Jesus emphasizes, I haven't lost any of them except the son of perdition, that scripture may be fulfilled, the one who betrayed our Lord. And later on, Jesus will say, and when he talks to Pilate, He'll refer to Judas as the one who has committed the greater sin, showing us that not all sins are the same. Verse 13, but now I am coming to thee and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Isn't that beautiful? Christ, he, he speaks these things in the world that his joy may be fully in us. It's underlined over and over and over again that his joy may be complete. It may be, may be fulfilled. But Jesus explains, as I said before in John chapter 15, 
His love is different than our concept of love. His friendship is different than our concept of friendship. His freedom is different than our concept of freedom. His peace is different than our concept of peace. And his joy is different than our concept of joy. If you understand those five differences, you're going to be able to help a lot of people understand the difference between I feel fine with my life and wow. Instead, I want to have Jesus's love. I want to have Jesus's peace. I want to have Jesus's joy. I want to have Jesus's concept of freedom and Jesus's concept of friendship. I will never feel fine with my life unless I have those things. Do you see? You see how we can explain that to people? Because a lot of people say, I'm fine. I feel fine. Everything's fine in my life. Yeah, but if you don't have all those things, Jesus's concept of love, freedom, joy, peace, and friendship, how could you feel fine with your life, right? And so Jesus says he wants his joy to be complete in our lives. Verse 14, I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not pray that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world. Sanctify. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Isn't that beautiful? Now, first and foremost, what does Jesus mean when he says they're not of the world? Paul explains this. He says we're in the world, but we don't belong to the world. And, and you know, you, you can examine your own life and ask yourself, you know, do, do I belong to this world? Are you motivated more by the things of this world than the things of God? Ask yourself that question. You know, am I motivated more by the things of this world or the things of God? And, and in order to be unworldly or otherworldly, maybe is a better way of putting it. You look at the, the you know, read through the history of the church and just read one story after another of the saints. I love to read little books on the saints and the martyrs. One of my favorite is a book that Alfonso Liguori wrote. It's called The Victory of the Martyrs by Alfonso de Liguori. And this is a great book where he, he goes through, in, you know, some scholars might say that he, he kind of, you know, goes out of his way to emphasize, you know, all the struggles of the, of the martyrs. Some think he, think he maybe goes too far, but I like the book because he's trying to help us to understand a lot of the struggles that they had, but especially how otherworldly they were for Jesus. That their, that their complete attention was to simply glorify the Lord. And, it's, and this is something that we can see in our own lives. If we live the faith and we're otherworldly, we're naturally going to come into contact with, uh, you know, uh, with this world and there's going to be division. We're going to hit the crossroads every single day. We have to choose what road am I going to take? Am I going to walk with Christ or am I going to kind of go with what the flow is going? Go with the world, go with the flow. You know, it, we go against the flow of the world. <laughs> so have you ever been to the beach? And, you know, when you I, what I love about going down to the local beaches over here is uh, if you go into the water and you're kind of coming out of the water, have you ever had that experience where you really the tide is really trying to pull you back out into into the water have you ever had that experience before you know you go to you're trying to get out of the water and the and the and the current because the wave is going back it's trying to pull you back out maybe you were swept away one time maybe you just lost your balance and whew, you went right back out there well that's what's happening to a lot of people they're being swept away by the current of this world do you see and in order to walk with christ you have to walk against the current and it's not easy it's not easy and so consider that. I'm not saying, you know, go to the beach and do that, but just consider that you have to walk against the current of this world. And it's a powerful current. It is sweeping many people away. And so you can see what Jesus is saying. The world hates them because I've given them your word. So let's go now to verse 17. He says, sanctify them in the truth to sanctify something. Is to, is to set something apart for a special purpose. That's kind of the root meaning of what holiness is. Holiness means something is set apart for a very special purpose, a unique purpose. And that's what God has done with us. Each one of us has a call to live a life of holiness. All of us have been set apart 
for a special purpose. And we have to recognize that the many things of this world will pull us away from that special call if we get caught up into those things, okay? And so, and so that's something to, to really recognize. And of course, you know, sometimes people say that um, people take, they go to one extreme when it comes to holiness and they just don't talk to anybody, okay? They're so holy you can't even talk to them, okay? And that's an extreme because we, we live in the midst of the holy people of God and we wanna encourage one another to live the faith uh, uh, together in Christ. But then the other extreme is where one is so worldly that they're swept away by the world. So we're in the world, we go out into the world, but we don't want to be swept away by this world. We want to bring others to Christ. And so sanctify them in the, the truth. Thy word is truth. What a beautiful devotion that each one of us should have. Reading scripture constantly, each day meditating on scripture. In verse 18, he says, as thou didst send me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Jesus repeats this saying over and over again. Just as the Father has sent him, now he's sending out his disciples, his apostles to go preach the gospel. Can I send myself out? Can I send myself? No. No, I can't send myself. I, you have, do you see the, the procession here? Christ is sent by the Father. Now he's going to send his church. He's going to return to the Father. The Spirit is going to be sent. And then the church is going to go out into the world. But we can't send ourselves. Paul says this in Romans chapter 10, right around verse 16. Or he says, how can one go preach unless they've been sent? Verses 14 to 16, okay? And so he's, he's kind of basically saying you can't send yourself. Just as Christ sent his disciples out to preach. And if you look at the church, you know, you, you look at there's a little bit of structure in the church. There's an authority in the church. And, you know, when you have any of you ever been to the ordination of a priest before? Have you ever been to one of those ordination ceremonies? And essentially that's what the church is doing. They're, they're ordaining one and they're sending them out to the world. Now, each of us, though, we all share in the universal call of evangelization, though. So all of us, on behalf of the fact that we've been baptized in Christ, you know, we have a calling to go out to the world and to share the gospel with others. Verse number 19. And for that and for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be consecrated in truth, set apart for a special purpose. Verse 20. I do not pray for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be what? One, even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now, do you notice this? Jesus is saying, I'm sending them out. I'm praying for the ones that are going to believe in their word, the apostolic witness of the church, that the church would be one. And it's something amazing when you read scripture and you see the unity of the church, especially you, if you go to Acts chapters 10 through 15, you see all the things that God did before the very first council in Jerusalem, before the Jerusalem council, when the church declared that the Gentiles are co-heirs with the Jews in Christ Jesus our Lord. And, and so it's, it's beautiful. We just take it for granted, but just to see the unity of the church through uh, the spirit and how that council took place in Acts chapter 15. Verse 22, the glory which thou hast given me, I have given to them that they may be what? One, even as we are one, I and them and thou and me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that thou has sent me and has loved them even as thou has loved me. Now, this is amazing. Do you notice, you know, in John chapter six, Jesus says, in, you know, in various ways, in about 10 different ways that we must eat his flesh and drink his blood in like 10 different ways. But look at John chapter 17. Another statement that's repeated probably about five different ways is that the church may be one. And the unity of the church, the unity of the church is a testimony of who Christ is, the oneness of the church. And you know, really, you have to start with every parish because every parish is like a family, right? Every parish is like a family. And in every family, you see good things. You see families that you know, they, they 
do things together, they love, you know, they, they do loving things together, but you also see a lot of fighting, arguing, bickering, you know, gossiping. And guess what you see in a lot of parishes? Every parish that I've been to, as I like to say, Catholics are true Israelites, right? Because everything you see the Israelites doing in the desert, I find that in just about every parish I go to. You know, you find people, you know, angry, they're upset, they're, you know, ready to rebel, they practically want to go back to Egypt, you know. And, and so it's something really to think about in every parish. How do we maintain the unity of Christ in this parish? So that the unity that we have as a universal church throughout the world can also be expressed in our parish so that people who come to this parish will see it. And I, I say that um, one of the things I've, I've seen so beautiful in a, a lot of biblical talks that I've done, people will invite non-Catholics from all different backgrounds. And when they get to know the community, a lot of them say, wow, I really want to I want to enter the church. I really want to enter the church because suddenly their vision, their understanding of the Catholic Church is transformed when they see the beauty of how united the community is in Christ, how holy the people are, how dedicated they are to the Lord. It completely changes everything they thought about the church. And so this is something, you know, really to think about when you when you bring friends and family members who are Catholic to church, you know, to, you know, when they experience the beauty of the community, they want to come into the church. And a lot of times we don't invite people. That's why you know, it doesn't happen all the time. But I want to encourage you to do so. But you have to be involved in the church for, them, for that to happen. If you're not involved in the community, if you don't know the community that well, it's going to be harder for them to see that. So we go to verse 23. Jesus says, oh, I'm sorry, is it verse 23 that we left off? Or verse 24. Verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom thou has given me may be with me where I am to behold my glory which thou has given me in thy love for me before the foundation of the world O righteous father the world has not known thee but I have known thee and these know that thou has sent me I made known to them thy name and I will make it known that the love with which thou hast loved me may be in them and I and them. And so at the very end of the prayer, Jesus underlines not just the unity of the church, but how he and the father will dwell in us. Of course, the, he, the father and, and the Holy Spirit. And so I, it, I stopped chapter 17 on that note. There's really th this chapter could really deserve hours of conversation, because as you see, there's so many profound theological statements that Jesus um, makes in this chapter. But I, before I finish, I want to say, go all the way back to the book of Genesis and remember when God called Abraham, he was just one person. He called Abraham and called him out of the Ur of the Chaldeans. And then he made this great promise that Abraham would have many descendants. He would have many descendants, right? His descendants would be like the dust of the earth, the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashore. And so God made this incredible promise to Abraham about many descendants. And this promise, of course, is going to be fulfilled in the person of Jesus. Why is it fulfilled in the person of Jesus? Because we, Paul explains in Romans chapter four and Galatians chapter three, Paul says that we are the true children of Abraham because we believe in the promises of God, which are fulfilled in Christ. And all that said, all that said, consider the prayer of Jesus. He wants this church now, which is the fulfillment of this great promise made to Abraham, to be united completely in the Father. And, I, and with that, I finish chapter 17. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, Amen.